Court of Appeal blames a Ministry of Health for possible financial loss in the 2.3 million euros ambulance saga minutes after quitting and discharging minority leader Kesela Tuforsin and businessman Richard Japa in ambulance trial. Also coming up, NDC flag bearer John Mahama says the Attorney General is behaving like a representative of the MPP as against being a Minister of Justice. We'll tell you why in an exclusive interview with us. Much later, Electoral Commission to compel political parties to meet gender equity target once affirmative action bill becomes law. Thank you very much for joining us today. Now, the Court of Appeal has described the conduct of the Health Ministry as reckless. In its full reasoned opinion in the Atoforsin case, the court blamed the Health Ministry for the procurement of ambulances which have been deemed to be defective. Let me bring you that part of the decision in that full judgment or ruling. It says the Ministry of Health was to ensure that pre-shipment inspection had taken place and all the conditions of the LC were met before payment. Not doing so, to my mind, was inexcusable and reckless because it is the Ministry of Health which approved all the payments apart from those ordered by the court. So that was given by Justice Kweku Aka. It continues to say, in my view, therefore, if anyone was culpable, it ought to be those in charge of the Ministry of Health and not a deputy minister for finance who, from the evidence, officially performed his duty. Again, so these are just excerpts of it. We've had the former president, John Mahama, also speaking on this decision and the political implications of it. He tells my colleague, Komla Kluche, that the Attorney General is behaving like a representative of the MPP rather than a Minister of Justice. Well, I think that it shows the vindication that he's innocent. We believe that this prosecution should never have taken place. Indeed, it came as a surprise because I had quite forgotten about the appeal. This appeal was made quite a long time ago um, when they um, filed a no-case petition before the court and the high courts, you know, uh, rejected it. And so they went up to appeal. So apparently it's been before the appeal court for quite a long time. So it came as quite a pleasant surprise. But it shows that um, we still have justice in this country and that um, we can uh, work to make the judiciary what we want it to be. Well, we have seen the AG really indicate that this is a perversion of justice uh, in, in the interest of uh public accountability uh one if you you were his appointor what would you have advised him to do at this stage well i think that this attorney general has been discredited enough anywhere in the world with the things we've seen and the coaching of witnesses and discussion with witnesses this prosecution that have been struck out as malicious prosecution i believe this prosecution is malicious he is not as, you know, robust and um, energetic in pursuing cases that are okay. Even just as we're talking, there's an ambulance case involving this present administration, which is hugely larger than what he's prosecuting, and yet he has no interest in that. He is like a legal representative of the MPP party, over enthusiastic in pursuing political opponents. I've said that when we come, it will be the reverse. We will pursue accountability for the regime that has gone out. But at the same time, if any of our people are involved in the same things that have happened for which we are prosecuting the opposition, we would uh, the pre previous government would prosecute them too. And so I think that the um, Attorney General is also the Minister of Justice. He forgets that. He thinks that he's just the Attorney General. The Minister of Justice is supposed to ensure fairness. Anywhere else in this well, this case would have been, and he would never even have come to court, not to talk about talking with witnesses, having conversations with witnesses, and trying to tell them what to do. Yeah, yeah this case should uh, have truncated long ago. The critics of your, yourself and the NDC say that uh, you have suddenly found your voice in reposing some sort of confidence in 
the judiciary. What's your reaction to this as well? No, not that we've certainly uh, found our voice. I do think that despite the issues we have with the judiciary, there are judges who are fair-minded. We're not talking about all judges. You know, in some cases, we criticize judgments. I mean, for instance, to say that your birth certificate cannot be a proof of your identity as a citizen. I don't agree with that judgment. But they pronounce it, and we've abided by it. We sent an election petition, we're thrown out. I said, I respect the judgment of the courts. So we've always respected the judgment of the courts. As president, I can say that I never, ever once interfered in the administration of justice, even though the chief justice was a church member of mine. You heard former President John Mahama in that exclusive interview with Komala Klucher. Now, political parties risk not receiving support from the Electoral Commission and State Protocol should they fail to achieve gender equity target once the Affirmative Action Bill becomes law. That's the stance of the AC. You would recall that Parliament yesterday historically passed the bill which had been outstanding in the House for more than two decades. Listen. It is not a bill for just women, it's a bill for all of us, it's a bill for development. This is the first stage. We have passed the law. We have to appropriate adequate resources for the ministry to lead the implementation of the provision that we have enacted. So we've just started. Don't let's celebrate and don't really put in place the vision that we have created for the country. But more importantly, I hope that members will commit themselves to the constitutional reforms. We need to do more there to be able to create this free and just society we are looking for, to liberate more of our women, to be able to support us, to be able to develop Mother Ghana. With this, I thank all of you for your support. And may the good Lord continue to bless Ghana. You heard that the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagwin, some MPs reacted to this immediately after this pronouncement from the Speaker of Parliament. We thank the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honourable Speaker Bagwin. Then we thank each and everyone in the chamber that made it possible. I expect that everybody should embrace it. All we are calling for is equity. We've broken that glass in. So we've made progress. But if the progress is backed by law and held by law, it's a good thing. So affirmative action, bill which has been passed, is a very good thing. Just I'm sure that no president, when he's appointed, will think about whether it's a man or a woman. I carried out amendment yesterday. In our political settings, we don't do nomination of candidates. So if you are urging upon the political parties to nominate women, what are you doing? You are referring to a safe seat in the opinion of the political party. So if in the op opinion of political party A, that is a safe seat, but in the opinion of political party B, that is not a safe seat, then it means that in the opinion of a political party that it is a safe seat, that should be exclusive reserve for a woman. And for a political party that does not consider it to be a safe seat, then every sex can contest. So what sense does it make? So we made a proposal that that be deleted, and the House has agreed upon it. You heard some MPs there reacting to the passage of the affirmative action bill as announced and done by Parliament yesterday. Let me now run you through what the bill provides for in terms of political parties. For political parties, says the parties are required to ensure progressive achievement of the gender equity target. Also, parties must provide information and financial resources. Gender equity targets must be factored into nomination of candidates, appointment or persons to serve as party officials. Again, electoral commission required to ensure that parties attain gender equity. Also, parties must submit annual report on gender equity to the electoral commission. And again, parties that fail to meet such requirement will not receive support in kind provided by the commission and receive courtesies provided by the state protocol. Uh, let's hear former gender minister Nana Oye Bampo, who's also been given her views as regards the passage of this bill that had been before parliament for more than 20 years. 
We're hoping he ascends to this next week as soon as possible. And and I must say that I've, I've read through the drafts and um, it's, it's a very strong um, piece. I mean, it's a very strong law that would help. It's outlined functions for independent constitutional bodies. It's outlined functions for the private sector. For the private sector, for instance, if you employ more women, you'll be given some tax incentives. Public service, they are under an obligation mm. to ensure um, representation of women. In the first schedule to the law, it sets out a target. So for the first two years, up to 2026, 30% minimum representation of women. The next two years to 2028 is 35%. And then by 2030, we are looking at 50 percent representation of mm. women across public sector across security services across the judiciary and what i like about this um, act is how every single institution has been giving its functions its role and what it's supposed to do you heard former gentleman minister nano yebampo uh, they're asking the president to ascend to this bill as soon as possible so it becomes law that's the affirmative action bill now former shraj boss justice emil short has expressed concern about the failure of shraj to bring closure to the killing of eight persons during the 2020 general election the comment comes as many including civil society groups question why there has not been justice for the individuals who died during the country's last major polls in an exclusive interview with me, Emil Short said, bringing finality to the issue will boost people's confidence ahead of this year's general election. I don't know what other constraints some of these institutions are going through that has made it difficult for them to complete the investigation. So I really cannot comment on, on, on this matter. But would you agree that it's been slow, four years down the line? Yeah, I, I would have expected that this matter would have been resolved um, yeah, uh, long ago, but um, yeah. here again, as I said, I'm not, I, I'm not in a position to determine why the investigation into the deaths which occurred has not been completed. My, 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 I think everybody would have expected that before the next election, you know, this matter would have been resolved. But, um, I'm not in a position to say why it has taken so long. What about accountability? In terms of if they fail or we get people getting injured or, or, or killed as, as just like what happened in 2020? Definitely accountability must be upheld. That is one area in which we have not done very well. Our accountability has been weak in our governance system. So definitely I hope that um, we would upgrade the level of accountability that we hold public officers to. Do you think it's possible for Shraj and other institutions to bring particularly those who are responsible for what happened in 2020 to book before we enter this year's election? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what challenges they are facing the reasons they have not been able to complete this investigation. So you should direct this question at those who have the responsibility to... Would you ask them to expedite action ahead of 2024? Uh, that would be desirable. You know, it will build greater confidence um, going forward with the 2024 election. You heard former Shraj boss Emil Short in that interview with me earlier. Now, the Public Account Committee has directed the Ministry of Fisheries and Aquaculture Development and the National Premix Fuel Secretariat to take immediate steps to retrieve an amount of 131,000 cities uh, from oil marketing companies. The companies uh, Petrol SP Company, Rice Globe Company Limited and Desert Petroleum Limited have been cited in the 23 Auditor General's report 
as having failed to pay the amount being administrative margins on fuel supply to the Premix Secretariat spanning the period of January to December 2022. Now, appearing before the committee on Wednesday, the Chief Director for the Ministry of Fisheries, Marian Papa, revealed that the companies are now default, are now defunct, and several efforts to trace the whereabouts of the managers have proved futile. Here are excerpts of that. The uh, three companies in question in uh, January uh, 2023 of last year, we wrote uh, to the companies demanding for the payment of their amount. Uh, we did not receive any response from them. We followed up with a visit to, the, to their offices that we were aware um, where they were operating from and realized that they had closed the offices and there was no one there. Um, we've tried to follow up to, uh, w to make contacts with individuals, we, uh, but to no avail. So we wrote to the Attorney General to assist us in uh, locating these companies and recovering the amount. Uh, recent follow-ups again with the companies, um, two of them uh, have indicated that uh, we were able to get uh, some individuals, I think the finance manager and uh, another uh, uh, officer in one of the companies who said that um, they will forward the information to their uh, superiors, and, but that we, we should give them some time. But those are the, so the, in respect to the steps that have been taken so far, we are trying to retrieve the amount uh, owed, owed, but to date we have not been successful. Thank you. Are these companies still operating? No, honorable. So where are the, dire the directors? So that is why I said that we were trying to find the companies, those who are behind the companies. and uh, You have transacted business with them all along. Does it mean that when you are doing business with them, you didn't know who you are dealing business with? We are, don't we have the administrator of the secretariat here? The administrator uh, has taken his annual leave. It was approved before this uh, uh, invitation. But there game. might be somebody from the secretariat who is here. If you respond to the issue. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Yes, we have information here on some of the directors of the company. Okay. And as the chief director rightly said, they were the people that we have communicated the information to mm. uh, with other officers and they promised to resolve an issue they have with the National Petroleum Authority and by close of August one of them, Petro XP, promised to uh, get back to us. Thank you. And you heard excerpts of that conversation between representatives from the Ministry of Fisheries and Agriculture before Parliament's Public Account Committee. We do understand that right now uh, representatives from the Ministry of Food and Agriculture are before the committee answering some questions. Let's cross over and take a listen to what's happening there. From the water region, I observe this abundance of tomatoes. Ah, look. From, from Sogakope, hold on, hold on. From Sogakope, from Sogakope right down to Sege. Look, tomato, yesterday, 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 I bought, I bought some tomatoes that I, I felt the price was unbelievable. But, but that was yesterday, yes. Anybody who, who, who would tell it? No, it's oh, so cheap compared to about, about three weeks ago. So the seasonality of some of these things determine the prices. That's for that one, it is established in Ghana. All right. But you see, this one, I don't need the research because I saw it yesterday myself. All right. Yes. All right. And, 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 All right. And, you, have, you have already conducted research and on this one. storage facilities are being put up everywhere. <laughs> Ghana for. Whoever uses that road. Honorable, honorable, honorable Minister. Honorable Minister. Uh, honorable Davis. Opoku Ansa popularly called OPK, uh, says that there is food in the abundance in Ghana. I'm sure you are going to trend today on the social media. Chairman, I mean, there's, there's empirical data to support it. Well, like, like, um, the, like if, the tomatoes if, on if, the if you, if you look at the success of the PFJ1, with the exception of one commodity, I mean, every of the food... And this is coming from statistical service, and I'm, mm. I'm speaking days on yet, facts. Yet food prices, food facts. inflation has been high. So, Chairman, that's why I'm saying that the, the, the factors that contribute to food prices 
it's not just about the planting and the harvesting of the product. Mm. Transport cost has a play. Okay. And the major cost is and the storage, the, lack the, of storage and facilities. And the PFJ didn't think, think about that. It is something that I want them to... The to project address. didn't think about that. The project didn't think about that. About the storage facilities. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Anyway, anyway. Mr. Chairman, uh, please, I'll, I know I won't allow you to... I will, pre I will personally a question. present you a, a, a copy of the PFJ report. And you know that all these things that we are talking about how are captured in that uh, how, how many storage facilities have you consulted? How many have you consulted? How many have you consulted? Uh, con constructed? 80 warehouses around the country. Not warehouses, not warehouses. Storage facilities. The park houses. No, we are, we are, no, we are, we are, we are, we are now building them. <laughs> the park houses you are now building. Yes, Honorable Bawa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I am coming from a food growing area, specifically. Ejura Sichidumasi. And uh, I would like, I, I think uh, Honorable Opiki, I don't know where he's getting the, his information from. Right now, every year at this season, this is supposed to be the harvesting season that we have new maize, new yam, cowpea. A bag of cowpea is selling. Yes, uh, yesterday, it was, uh, Monday was a drama market day. A bag of cowpea was selling at 2,700 Ghana cities. A bag of maize, fresh maize from the farm, is selling at farm gate, is selling at 800 Ghana cities. What kg? What kg? What kg? For what kg? Yes. A bag of, uh, uh, be between 120, 125 kg. So I'm coming, I'm coming. Let me finish. And if you, uh, uh, right now, that I'm, uh, uh, as we are speaking, the cost of production is the reason why food prices are high. If you go to the tractor services, one acre is taking 400 Ghana cities. A bag of uh, fertilizer now, as we speak, a bag of MPK at the market, you know it, is over 400 Ghana cities. A bag of uh, ammonia. Is, so the cost of production is even making the farmers, they, they are not even, even able to, 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 to break even. And you heard excerpts of that conversation between representatives of the Ministry of Agriculture and also uh, members of the Public Accounts Committee. And as you heard that, they were talking about food prices. We'll bring you some more, I'm sure, as the conversations continue, there will be more perspective to this. We stay on food and agriculture because though... Uh, this sector is the backbone of Ghana's economy. The sector continues to face challenges in terms of access to affordable and productive technologies. The situation often leads to low yields and decline in the income of most farmers, posing a threat to food security. To make access to agriculture technologies easy and cheap, the Crops Research Institute of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research is partnering large-scale farm enterprises to bridge the gap between technology development and utilization. Ibrahim Abubakar has more. One of the main challenges in Western Central Africa is that most of our farmers are still using all technology that are not really well performing. Why actually at the level of research institution, there's a lot of technology that have been developed by the research. This consumption is actually paving the way so that in the future, it will be easy for technology developed at the level of research to get to the farmers. It means that the research institution and the farmers and the private sector are going to work together to create an environment to facilitate the transfer of this technology. So you had a representative there from the Crops Research Institute of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research uh, speaking to Ibrahim Abubakar, who actually joins us on the phone now. Ibrahim, can you identify who uh, we just listened to and if you can tell us what farmers have been saying about this initiative? Well, um, that's actually um, Dr. Marie. She is the technical director of CORAF. Um, CORAF is the West and Central African Council for agriculture research and development. They, together with World Bank, are supporting this initiative, um, making um, the Crop Research Institute of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research lead. We already know that this is a government institute that comes out with uh, varieties of technology just so they'll be able to support farmers. So this consortium means that 
and the large scale farm enterprises um, will be getting all the um, um, productive or uh, new varieties of seeds that um, the crop research brings out and um, it will make sure that it is readily available and also very very affordable for them so and um, it's come as a good news for the farmers because they are saying that all along their main challenge has to do with access to these um, improved seedlings and that's where their chunk of their money also goes into so if they are getting such partnership it means and uh, they wouldn't be able to spend more on such seedlings which also means that they will have the chance to expand their farming activity um, to help the country achieve the food security uh, it aims. Thank you very much. Uh, Ibrahim Abubakar reporting live from the Ashanti region. Some politics and the Central Regional House of Chiefs have, uh, have, has rallied its support behind the running mate of the NDC to become Ghana's first ever female vice president, reposing confidence in her stewardship to the country in her previous employment at the Cape Coast University. The Regional House of Chiefs expressed optimism that her decorum and decency will bring pride to the office of the vice president. A report by Komla Klucha. We'll bring you that report later in our subsequent bulletins. But on the camp of the NPP, the vice president and flag bearer of the governing party, Dr. Mahmoud Abaumia, has also charged the electorates to vote for him as a new president with a bright vision to transform the country. Dr. Baumia, who has been campaigning in the northern part of the country, wrapped up his Upper East Regional Tour last night in Bolgatanga. <laughs> It's a historic election. We have a choice between going into the future or going back to the past. That is the choice that faces us. Do we want to go to the future or go back to the past? The future or the past? This election will produce a new president for the Republic of God. A new president. Not a second-hand failed president. Not a second-hand failed president. When John Mahama was president, he said he wanted to develop the North. He set up the Savannah Accelerated Development Authority. They spent hundreds of millions. Have you seen one SADA project in Bolga? Have you seen one SADA project in Upper East? One SADA project in Upper West? One SADA project in the Northern Region, North East or Savannah? There is not one. And you heard that the vice president and flag bearer of the governing new patriotic party, Dr. Mahmoud Baumea. And in the bulletin here on 3FM 92.7. My name is Beatrice Edu. Thank you very much for joining us today. Log on to shrewnews.com for more news. Have a good afternoon. Gets busy on this frequency. 92.73 FM. If you're searching for a dial on radio that was sunshine in your heart in stereo, look no further for no other than 92.7. Feel the heat in stereo.
there. Good afternoon and welcome to Business Daily here on 3FM 92.7. Coming up this afternoon, Ghana Private Road Transport Union, GPR to you, hints at proceeding with planned increase in transport fares despite predicted decline in fuel prices by 4%. We'll hear from its union in, uh, industrial relations officer, Abbas Imoro. that we should reduce the lorry fares because there has been so many sacrifices the recent increments you can remember insurance premium alone went up by 10 percent also bank of ghana deploys centralized foreign exchange platform with mandatory ghana card verification directive for forex bureau effective tomorrow august 1 we'll bring you details plus new study cities uh, sides government's areas, macroeconomic instabilities, among other factors for persistent high non-performing loans recorded by banks. I am Michael Obudu. I'll bring you details of these stories and more shortly. Please stay. Well, thank you so much for your time. Straight into our top story, the Institute for Energy Security, IES, is projecting an up to 4% decline in prices of fuel at the pumps effective tomorrow. This comes as a result of drop on the global market of the price of crude oil and the relative stability of the local currency against the U.S. dollar. Meanwhile, the Ghana Union of uh, uh, Private Road Transport Union, GPRTU, has indicated that it will proceed with its planned increase in transport fares despite a projected drop in fuel prices. Earlier, the GPRTU announced plans to hike transport fares due to the significant rise in fuel cost. Speaking to three business, Industrial Relations Officer at GPRTU, Alaji Abasi Muru, emphasized that fuel is not the only operational cost factor for transport operations in the country the public should be aware it's not automatic that we should reduce the lawyer fares because there has been so many sacrifices the recent increments you can remember insurance premium alone went up by 10 percent other as a lubricants I can even say around 40 percent the spare pass was there documentations like other DVLA other permits that all those amount also shoot up. So, and the public should be aware. Recently, recently there was an issue of which uh, something small was put on the fuel. And one arm, should I use them one arm? Because they are part of this. You heard concern came out that uh, they wanted us to increase law affairs. We said no. We have something. Uh, we say 10% threshold of which we haven't gotten there. So we feel that's not the way. And we came up and condemned it and we are living with it. So we sensitize the public that it's not just any reduction on fuel, which could also attract reduction on law affairs. So they shouldn't come and fight us. They should take it easy. We have other items which are still at the higher prices. But of course, I must be honest with myself and with the general public. If it's going to be true that a fuel price shall be reduced by some margin, we'll be very happy to, to, to somehow try to stabilize our income for us. So we we'll welcome it. But until it has come, it hasn't come. But if it's really going to come, we'll, all professional drivers will welcome it. I believe even the private cars as well. So that was Industrial Relations Officer of the Ghana Private uh, Road Transport Union, GPR to you, Alhaji Abbas Imero speaking. Then away from that, the Bank of Ghana has launched a new centralized foreign exchange trading platform requiring all licensed foreign exchange bureaus uh, to conduct their transactions exclusively through this system starting August 1, 2024. This initiative aims to enhance the integrity and supervision of foreign exchange market. The following three business news desk report has more. In a press release, the Bank of Ghana announced the launch of centralized trading platform for all licensed foreign exchange bureau, effective August 1, 2024. The bank stated that this new platform is part of its efforts to enhance the safety and efficiency of the foreign exchange market, ensuring compliance 
with the Foreign Exchange Act 2006, Act 723, and the Anti-Money Laundering Act, Act 1044. According to the bank, all transactions involving the buying and selling of foreign currencies must be conducted through this centralized system. Key features include mandatory trading with licensed dealers, the issuance of electronic receipts, and the verification of customer identities using the Ghana card or passport. In line with the Bank of Ghana's notice, all persons seeking to buy or sell foreign currencies must provide a Ghana card or passport for foreign nationals and undergo biometric verification. The Bank of Ghana emphasized that the platform is integrated with the National Identification System and the National Payment Platform to facilitate secure and transparent transactions. The bank's regulator reminded the public to conduct foreign currency exchanges only with licensed dealers to ensure compliance and safety. That was a three business news desk report on the Bank of Ghana's introduction of a centralized Forex platform with mandatory Ghana card verification for Forex bureaus in the country. Now, a new study has attributed the bank's uh, rising non performing loans to factors including ever increasing government arrears, macroeconomic instability poor credit risk management and high fiscal deficits. Last week, during a press briefing at the 119th meeting of the Monetary Policy Committee's review, Bank of Ghana Governor Dr. Ines Addison disclosed that the industry's NPL ratio had jumped to 24.1% in June 2024 from 18.7% during the comparable period of 2023, highlighting elevated credit risk in the system. This report has more. The study examining the period from 2014 to 2023 shows that at the end of December 2023, non-performing loans, NPLs, were estimated at 24.9% and several banks, including systematically important domestic banks and subsidiaries of reputable international banks, reported higher NPL ratio in the range of 20 to 40%. This comes as global data from 72 countries, including several African nations, paints a green picture of Ghana's position. As of December 2022, Ghana ranked fourth highest globally with an MPO rate of 15%, which further deteriorated to 24.6% in 2023. This places Ghana behind only Equatorial Guinea with 55.1% and Chad, who had 27.1%, while significantly underperforming regional peers like Cote d'Ivoire with 8.8% and Nigeria, who had 4.01%. Ghana's average NPO ratio from 2014 to 2023 stands at a concerning 16.9%, with the lowest figure of 11% in 2014 and the highest of 24.9% in 2023, indicating a prolonged and worsening crisis. By mid-2024, non-performing loans NPLs reached their highest point in March at 26.7%. Subsequently, the rate decreased to 24.1% by June 2024. The surge in NPLs is attributed to a complex interplay of factors. The International Monetary Fund's recent country report confirms that governments had accumulated significant areas in both energy and non-energy sectors during the past decade. That was a three business news desk report. And that will be all for today's edition of Business Daily here on 3FM 92.7. For more business stories, please check out our website. It's 3news.com forward slash business. I am Michael Obudu. Thank you for listening. As always, please stay safe. Up next is Urban Blend with Blackbuster. Please stay tuned.